Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sara Pantuliano. I'm the chief executive here at ODI, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to today's discussion on the future of UK international development. Um, that's a discussion that we are convening following the announcement by the government that it will merge the Foreign and Commonwealth Office with the Department for International Development in September. Now, defeat returning to the warm embrace of uh, the Foreign Office, it's not really unexpected. You know, the merger has been mooted since I think the 2015 um, general election at the very least. But the timing of the merger in the midst of a, you know, a pandemic really came um, as more of a surprise. And I think it's fair to say that you know, many NGOs in particular in the development sector have greeted the move with alarm and to some extent uh, dismay. Now, I don't think anyone doubts that tackling the interconnected crisis that the world faces today from you know, obviously the pandemic to climate, poverty, conflict, geopolitical instability, it really requires a whole of government um, response. And that will need to combine the development and poverty reduction expertise of DFID, but also the diplomatic adroitness of the Foreign Office, as well as you know, skills that um, lie with uh, other departments like trade and defense. And we need you know, more collaboration, more coordination, both within governments and internationally, you know, including with increasingly beleaguered multilateral institutions. In addition to that, the development paradigm that we have been following for, you know, for half, half a century really, um, I think is no longer fit for purpose. Um, just look at the debates we're all having around decolonizing development and how um, development does need to change, the sector needs to change, the world has changed, and as development practitioners, we need to change with it. But having said that, over the years, DFID, has also established a global reputation as a leading voice on developing on development policy and practice. I think the expertise of DFID, the results that DFID has been able to bring, have made it a very well respected example of global Britain at its best. So the way the merger is managed will be crucial um, to its success. You know, and preserving and championing development expertise will be a critical element of that. We've heard a lot of skeptical voices about how ODA is going to be politicized and you know how UK aid will be diverted from supporting um sub, you know for supporting the most vulnerable. And of course, there's a lot of concern that without having a voice at the cabinet table, um, development priorities um, will not fare well against uh, national interest imperatives. But other countries have been there before. I have taken a different approach to managing their development corporations. Um, Canada, the Netherlands, who are represented on our discussion today, have separate ministries you know, for international development on one side and foreign trade and development cooperation um, on the other side. Um, and they have you know, separate um, uh, ministers despite not having separate government departments. So you know, perhaps that provides uh, a model for the UK. But we're also interested to hear the perspective of partner countries that received aid, you know, um, that received aid from DFID uh, and have worked with the Foreign Office historically. There's been a lot of talk in the UK about, you know, what the merger means for, you know, some of the world's poorest countries, but we haven't really heard much of the perspective of these countries, of the countries that receive UK aid. You know, we haven't really um, heard their voice on this. So it is with this reflection in mind that ODI has convened this panel. You know, we brought together representatives from OECD countries who have different institutional structures for development cooperation and, you know, from partner countries with whom DFID works, the DFID supports, but also from UK civil society. So what we really want to discuss today is both the opportunities and the challenges that our panel foresees for the merger and how we can help make this a success. Um, ultimately, we want to make sure that in the process, um, the UK can build something better rather than you know, losing what, what it had before. And to discuss this, we have a fantastic panel today. Uh, we are joined by His, His Excellency uh, Manoa Ezipisu, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Kenya to the UK. 
Elisa Goldberg, the Assistant Deputy Minister for Strategic Policy of Global Affairs Canada, um, Brigitte Tazelar, the Deputy Director General for International Cooperation at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Danny Sriskandaraja, who is the Chief Executive of Oxfam GB. And we have an incredibly fantastic and numerous audience with us. More than 550 people have registered to, to join the discussion today. So please do enter your questions in the chat box below the event you know, where you're watching, and I'll be bringing you in um, as the discussions progress throughout the discussion. Uh, but also, please do tweet. Use a, a hashtag UKAID and tweet your questions, your comments, make the discussion buzz online um, as well. But without further ado, let's get the discussion started. And I want to really, you know, kick start the conversation by um, coming to Ambassador SEP so and really um, asking from, you know, from a Kenyan perspective, what you think the critical priorities of the new department should be? What it is? What is it that the new department should consider, uh, particularly in East African context? Yeah, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Thank you for, well, for, for inviting me to speak at, uh, at this event. I think the, the most important things for, for us in, in Kenya and in East Africa is to understand what it is that the UK wants to achieve. We know for sure that uh, Kenya and the UK have a long history, uh, which has brought together our governments, it's brought together our business people, and it's brought together our ordinary citizens. There are more than 30,000 British nationals in Kenya. There are more than 100,000 British tourists who visit Kenya every year. And there are more than 200,000 people of uh, Kenyan extraction who, who live and work here in the UK. So we have uh, a lot of shared, sh shared history. And we know for sure that Kenya matters uh, for trade and investment. The UK is Kenya's top overseas uh, investor with more than 220 companies uh, with a trade of more than a billion uh, pounds every year. And we know that Kenya matters for security, both nationally and regionally, because of the areas uh, of conflict, terrorism. We know about uh, radicalization and we know about uh, the, our neighbors that are often uh, having trouble. We also know that uh, Kenya matters in the area uh, of, of the trade objective. So we know that there are things that the UK is concerned about, that Kenya is concerned about. And we know that we can work together to deal with, with these issues. So what's been our approach, therefore, to, 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 to this? We are not overly concerned about the merger be, uh, the, of, of DFID into FCO. We are concerned that the priorities that uh, they con the, the UK continues to espouse are the same as our priorities. Uh, we uh, in Kenya agreed a strategic partnership agreement with the UK during the Africa summit in January. And that strategic partnership agreement dealt with five areas. One was uh, mutual prosperity. So that is the area of trading and investment. We talked about security and stability. Uh, that's ensuring that our uh, borders are, are, are safe, that the region is safe, that there is peace. We talked about sustainable development. So support for impl implementation of devolution, for instance, support for urbanization in Kenya uh, and areas like that. And we talked about climate change, which is both uh, important to us uh, in Kenya and the UK. We talked about mechanisms uh, for cooperation uh, under, under UN type uh, arrangements. Uh, and we talked about people to people uh, cooperation. So increasing scholarships, for instance, and fellowships to Kenyans, building capacity for, for the Kenyan people, areas like that. So we do expect that when it comes to uh, how we engage with the UK, that the areas that have been traditionally focused areas, so your education, health, uh, health, uh, uh, peace, 
security, defense, and trade. Those things that are important in ensuring that more Kenyans are lifted out of poverty and that the region can work in a more sustainable way. But those things will continue to be uh, a focus uh, of the UK uh, uh, government when it is uh, disbursing aid under the, the new arrangements. Uh, but we also care that there is a greater emphasis on, on trade. So the trade arrangements uh, within Kenya and the UK and the trade arrangements with East Africa, as well as uh, all, 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 all initiatives that are brought in, in shape to ensure that we produce uh, uh, more, we manufacture more, we process more. Uh, and if the UK is uh, partnering with us to ensure that this value is delivered, then we think that the Kenyan people and the East African people will feel that uh, progress is being made. Yes, there are uh, concerns about potential uh, cuts to uh, the amount of money that is available. Uh, this basket is, is, is never going to, to, to be at a standstill. We always think the basket is always going to go down. It's a question of how do you as a country uh, prioritize your areas of, of focus? And how is, uh, does the convergence work between what a country wants to achieve and what the donor wants to achieve? I think if your objectives uh, find a convergence, then you are going to make progress. I don't think that it is always a situation where uh, the, 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 the donor has objectives uh, that, that don't really work with the country's objectives. I think you've got to find a way in which uh, the, the, the country's objectives in dealing with poverty alleviation, that those objectives are helped by, by, by a donor country uh, to, to try to achieve. Uh, and I think from our perspective, we think that we are in a position where uh, we agree uh, with the UK about a lot of the areas in which uh, support is required so that we can move the country forward. Thank you. Great, that's very clear. A very quick follow-up questions before I go to the other panelists. You clearly, you know, uh, say, said you know, you're not concerned about the merger. Yes, there could be you know, the importance is, of course, aligning the objectives. Do you think is there is any particular mechanism that could benefit? Um, the you know they could ensure really that the merger um, continues to uh, allow this uh, um, convergence of objectives, as you called it. We think there's there's got to be consultation between uh, be, be, between the UK and the countries involved. I mean, there might be areas in which they they wish to 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 reduce or to cut. Uh, a to, uh, but it is only after a meaningful dialogue that you can make these decisions and move forward in a meaningful way. Uh, after all, uh, the, the, the essence of aid is to lift people out of poverty and to get countries to, to, to grow. Uh, in order to ensure that there is this shared benefit, that there is mutual prosperity, we've got to do something uh, that reflects both the wishes of the countries involved as well as the donor country. Great, thanks. Um, let me come to Elisa. Elisa, we've discussed this many times, um, and you know, we've discussed particularly the fact that the, the merging of the departments in Canada has actually generated positive outcomes. You know, not least um, creating a strategic benefit for the development agenda and enhancing you know its policy influence within government. So, seven years on, <laughs> if you reflect on the experience of the merger in Canada. What do you think are the main lessons and you know, unseen opportunities that perhaps in the UK we're not seeing at the moment that you can share from that experience? Then I'll come to the challenges later. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks very much, Sarah, uh, for inviting me to be part of the conversation with colleagues. Um, we have been having lots of discussions with our friends at DFID uh, and at FCO um, because we're very keen to make sure that uh, just as we had benefited from talking with our partners uh, before Canada embarked uh, on its amalgamation, that we also share what we've learned from our experiences. And here, I have to give a shout out to Brigida's team. Um, the Netherlands was very generous uh, in sharing their experiences with us. Um, 
I like how you started uh, because I, I really would say that, of course, our amalgamation experience and in our context, it was the bringing together of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and uh, the former Canadian International Development Agency into one entity. And I think that that decision, uh, I was overseas at the time. Uh, I was our ambassador to the UN in Geneva. And so looking at it from the outside and then coming back to headquarters, um, it really, what struck me coming back was that it led, it has led to better public policy making for Canada in the international affairs domain. Um, it's not always consistently the case, but I would say that it has certainly enhanced our ability to provide coherent advice to government. Um, we don't have those um, unintended bureaucratic uh, frictions that exist when you're two separate entities and you have to kind of negotiate to bring everything together. And then maybe there's uh, discussions that have to happen between different political entities because we're agreeing and negotiating and working through that within the organization itself. And our advice that goes up to government is consolidated advice. Uh, we've had these discussions and debates uh, internally. It's also enabled us to better maximize all the tools that we have uh, at our disposal. Um, particularly, I think, Sarah, as you mentioned, at this moment in time, uh, when we think about the global issues that we're grappling with, um, obviously the pandemic, but strains on the rules-based international system, our collective efforts to advance the sustainable development goals. Um, the benefits of an integrated department mean that we can bring with us diplomacy, advocacy, um, stabilization tools, development, trade and investment as part of uh, an integrated package. Again, not always consistently. Uh, this is a journey. Uh, we're still, there's lots of things like with any big organization that you're continually trying to improve. Um, but I would say that the issues that we're grappling with today don't fit neatly into a purely political, economic or development sphere. And there are the, the benefits that we've seen by bringing those together. Um, Maybe a couple of things that I, I would say at the outset in terms of some of the, the key lessons, um, because when we started the process, as I mentioned, we really wanted to listen and learn from others. And so there were extensive internal consultations with the staff in strategic engagement with um, uh, partners, uh, including partners within civil society, um, but then sitting down really uh, and engaging with our international partners that had gone through it before. And I would say that there were two overarching um, lessons that they flagged for us that have proven in practice to have been quite prescient. The first was around culture. Uh, we repeatedly heard that culture takes time to adapt uh, and that we have to be patient and flexible, um, fostering change in a very purposeful and mindful way. The second uh, issue that our counterparts flagged was the importance of continuing to value expertise of the individual streams um, in delivering policy and programming that draws on the best operational and technical capabilities throughout the whole of the organization. And, and I'll come back to that. Um, and so we thought hard about those two key lessons because they were, re they were referenced uh, with all of the different colleagues that we talked about. And so when we decided to pursue our integration, we uh, looked at it uh, essentially in four buckets. The first was workforce integration. The second was policy integration. The third was operations integration. And then the fourth was coherence and evaluation. And I'm happy to expand on any of those in the, in the discussion, but I want to come back to those first two key issues and what were some of our takeaways and, and how did we approach it. So on culture, uh, what I would say is we were very conscious that we needed to recognize that you're harmonizing different speeds. Um, international development uh, efforts and international assistance, it's a medium to long term horizon. These are these are things that take a long time in order to be able to uh, progress on in some instances, not always, but it's a long term horizon. Uh, often within the foreign and trade ministries, it is, uh, there is a, a percussion uh, of activity that happens in response to events, negotiations. And so you're, you're trying to figure out how to make sure that those two cultures uh, are able to talk to each other and understand one another. And that really requires a deliberate ongoing focus. And I would say at all levels and uh, including in terms of how you address recruitment, training, innovation and, and recognition, um, including creating incentives, particularly at the middle management level 
to foster that uh, collaboration around culture. Uh, I, the other thing is, is governance. Be very strategic about the governance that you create. Foster those opportunities for collaboration. Also look for the quick wins uh, where you're showcasing what the advantages are uh, of bringing together uh, all of these different assets and expertise. Um, what helps in that respect is encouraging joint planning, integrated planning across all the business lines. Um, staff found it much easier to understand the work of their colleagues, to identify uh, areas where they of interest, uh, opportunities for collaboration when they had a genuine process of joint planning. And we also sequenced uh, the amalgamation. So the organizations were brought together, um, but then it took a few years to really pull the amalgamation down. So at our geographic uh, desks, for instance, it started at integration at the assistant deputy minister level. So your level at the, just under the permanent secretary, but now it's all the way down to the desk level. Um, and that, that's really where we started to see the benefits uh, and the advantages of, the, of coherence. Um, on valuing expertise, I would just say quickly, and then we can come back to it later, is again, we've been very deliberate in this respect, um, wanting to make sure that we don't lose the, as the benefits of what comes from these technical uh, areas. That's what brings the value of pulling it all together. But we really needed to rethink how we were going to address that. And so we've revamped our School of Foreign Service um, to orient ourselves towards the competencies that we're looking for in each area of expertise expertise, and at the same time then using that as an opportunity to establish what we call a common core, that there's a common core of competencies and expertise that we expect everybody to have, and that also helps with that culture piece, right? So how we think about data, how we think about approaching multilateral negotiations, how we think about policy design, uh, gender-based plus analysis. There are certain things that we expect every officer, irrespective of stream, to have, and that creates that common platform for us uh, as well. The other thing that we did was we really seized opportunities to merge policy teams uh, quickly. Um, so there is really an advantage to maximizing the knowledge that comes from these different vantages. So where, you know, DFID and FCO each have teams, for instance, that look at issues related to democracy, human rights, fragility, conflict and violence, um, private sector led growth. There are these opportunities to bring those two, those two teams together um, to really then drive forward policy and program development. I, say, I would say, you know, while the colleagues identified culture and valuing expertise as two challenges, there was a third that nobody mentioned that, that we have, it's taken us some time to be able to come to ground on, and that was the challenge that emerged on uh, aligning information management technology systems and reporting mechanisms across business lines. I know it's not very sexy, uh, but actually if you don't get that stuff right, it can act as uh, an impediment to coherence, right? If you've got different reporting structures, if your um, ways of managing information and data and partnerships don't can't engage, it hinders your abilities to be coherent both at headquarters and in the field. Um, so maybe I'll stop there, but just to say that the work to further deepen the cultural and collaborative instincts, that's, a, that's an ongoing process, but honestly the dividends in terms of enabling greater policy coherence in support of Canada's sustainable development agenda has been clearly evident to us. Wow, thank you. There was a lot in there, you know, for us to reflect on, you know, in terms of lessons that clearly um, you also, in, you know, reflected um, upon um, while talking to colleagues that had been there before, you know, like you said, you know, Brigitte team, you know, before before Canada. Um, Brigitte, let me come to you uh, because one one key discussions in, in the UK is about, you know, the, the, the fear, the danger of losing the voice, you know, with, you know the development expertise within um, this merged department. And of course, you know, your Director General for International Cooperation sits under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs alongside three others. So how do you ensure that your voice is heard, not just within the department, but across government? Mm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And let me first um, say that I always looked up to our big cousin, DFID, uh, because they have always had bigger budgets, they've had uh, bigger staff, 
and they have also always had, I must say, better articulated policies. Um, and all of a sudden, now DFID is going to be under the roof of MFA, and one wonders, is that reason for alarm? Uh, well, maybe not, um, because now DFID will find itself in a position similar to um, to ours, meaning development cooperation being part of foreign affairs, uh, living under the same roof, uh, sharing the same resources and staff, etc. And yet, if I were to say that uh, Dutch development aid is separate from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I think many would believe it. Um, so let me make a few remarks uh, regarding um, uh, how to make your voice heard, but also how to safeguard um, uh, and protect the development ambitions. Amb uh, ambitions. Um, I think, first of all, uh, in the Netherlands, and probably you have the same in the UK, we have a very robust support for development cooperation uh, in, in society. Uh, and that has been the basis for a very strong uh, development cooperation autonomy. Um, but I must say, over the last decade, or maybe even a little bit more than a decade, the popular or the political support for the development cooperation has somehow eroded. And to be honest, I think that is a major concern for the future uh, of principal development work, more so than any institutional arrangement. Uh, secondly, I would say that uh, what really matters uh, is the political autonomy. And the Netherlands development policies have always been uh, DAC proof. Um, or in the end, we believe that this principal development policy is what makes a difference. And it's important that this, has all, that this is translated into policies. It is always part of our coalition agreement. Uh, we've got our own policy notes uh, being written, sent to Parliament, which are then the basis also for being accountable to Parliament. Uh, so it's always very clear what our objectives are and how we're going to pursue them. Um, thirdly, I think Elisa, Elisa made the exact point, and by listening to Elisa, I think it's time for us to come to you and learn from you again, because you've clearly leapfrogged us. Um, but it's the, the, uh, the, the, the item of expertise. Um, and because this is something that currently, when you merge, you will have your expertise, but how to retain your expertise? It's an area where we find now a lot of difficulties, because to be honest, we have, we have not kept up uh, ensuring that we have enough expertise in our own stream of development cooperation. Um, so make sure that when uh, diplomats are recruited, you have a, a good number of diplomats with a development cooperation background and experience. And make sure that you have an opportunity to hire specialists, uh, whether it's in the area of digitalization or climate or uh, any subject that is relevant to your development cooperation, um, uh, not from the foot, but, but also those people who have about five or ten years experience and who bring that experience into your, into your, um, uh, into your ministry. Um, and ensure also, which is really important, that you have sequential planning uh, uh, for, for people. Currently, we are having in our embassies, the, uh, the, uh, where we have got a lot of, where we do a lot of development cooperation, our second in charge is always the head of development cooperation. So that's a deputy ambassador. And currently, in a number of countries, we've got deputy ambassadors slash heads of cooperation that have no background in development cooperation because we have not put enough effort into ensuring that we have the right people moving into that stream. And that's, a, that's, a, that's also the risk of being part of a, of, a, of a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that other missions, other posts are becoming more interesting for people and they would rather go to, let's say, Madrid than to Niger. Um, and then the fourth point I would make is, well, is money. Uh, you know, I think the Scots will recognize that the Dutch are always looking at the money as well. And make sure that the contribution that you pay to the overhead is clearly calculated and is calculated on objective criteria. So what overhead is DFID going to pay once it is part of SEO based on the number of employees and make, make clear agreements that once there are austerity measures or maybe in the future there's going to be more money that you have a, a good model to calculate what then becomes the new 
um, the new overhead for um, for the directorate dealing with development cooperation to pay for the overall overall um, uh, uh, overhead of the uh, of the ministry and and the missions. And then when it comes to making your voice heard, that's the last point maybe on on on, on making your voice heard ac across uh, government. Of course, we still have a cabinet minister for aid and trade. Um, so we've got one ministry, two ministers. The Minister for Foreign Affairs is responsible for the whole staff. But the Minister for Development Cooperation has the money. Um, but every Friday, both of them uh, sit at the cabinet table. And that's an extremely important way of ensuring that your voice is continuously being heard. And that also from a development perspective, the minister can can discuss on issues from an integrated approach. Um, and linked to the fact that we've got a separate minister um, is also the fact that we still have a separate um, parliamentary committee in the House of in our House of Commons, in our in our parliament. And that clearly also puts development cooperation on the agenda, ensures that questions are being asked, ensures that letters are being written to Parliament, ensures ensures there's scrutiny and that there's debate about about development cooperation and its impact. Um, and lastly, related to that, is of course really important to always keep good relations with the other ministries. Um, and that's on every level, the level of the, um, the Minister for Development Cooperation, on the level of the Director Generals, on the level of the Directors dealing with Development Cooperation. And there are plenty of themes that, 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 that require and that, that facilitate this discussion with other ministries, such as the SDGs, climate, uh, migration, asylum, uh, the top sectors uh, in the Netherlands that provide expertise for development cooperation. So there's plenty of, uh, of opportunity, but it, it takes an effort and one has to put an effort into it in ensuring that, we, that these relationships are, are, are good and profound and, and, and productive. Uh, but I must say that I think the, uh, His Excellency uh, Mansoa made, I think, the best remark because to ensure that there is that you safeguard and protect development ambition and that your voice is heard, is to ensure that uh, whatever you do is in partnership with the country that you want to uh, assist and work with. I think that's uh, that's the bottom line of everything. So, Sarah, as a start, maybe uh, I can stop here. Fantastic. Perfect. Um, so a lot of, again, very useful pointers in terms of the safeguards and, you know, the accountability mechanism that has been a big part of the debate here in the UK. So on that, I'll come straight to you, Danny, because the past few weeks, you know, there's been very active, um, quite vocal debate and a lot of concerns, you know, especially uh, from civil society, particularly around the objectives. Um, of the merger, but you know a lot also about the fear of losing this focus on poverty reduction, and I'd really like you to help us reflect on you know whether that framing is almost like a bit reductive. You know, having heard you know the comments from um, Ambassador ACPs and just you know generally also the experience of Canada in the Netherlands, whether we're still framing you know development particularly uh, in light of the debates we're having, as I was saying, on decolonizing development and how we are approaching you know. The the, um, the future of international development and whether you know the rethinking also of the structures needs to uh, to follow. Great, thank you, thanks, Sarah, for for having me. And it's um, fascinating, timely discussion. And it's good that you've had um, the Dutch and Canadian perspectives. And I, I think Elisa and Brigitte have made a, a really compelling case for why it's not necessarily a bad thing to have an integrated approach or even an integrated government machinery. Uh, in this way. And certainly as a consumer of aid and having worked with both the Canadian and Dutch government, I can uh, say that I've seen it work well. Um, I remember very clearly Liliana Pluman when she was a Dutch Minister for Trade and Development, I felt was a more powerful spokesperson for development interests because she carried that brief. Or I've seen successive Canadian Ministers for International Development, Marie-Claude Bibo or Karina Gold, speak more powerfully because they are part of a feminist foreign policy that that is brought into it seems from outside from the very top of Canadian government um, and so the, the issue here is not necessarily that this is always a bad thing I think it's um, in the UK at the moment uh, and I think I can already see some questions coming in it feels like this is a move that's been done for the wrong reason and and for me the, the really worrying clues have been in the 
timing and presentation of this um, move. Um, you know, for those of us in, in civil society, it's really dismaying to see that, you know, in the midst of the world's worst pandemic, perhaps biggest humanitarian crisis, the UK government has chosen this moment, this moment to look at the, gov the machinery of government just at a time when we need differed personnel, differed resources, and all of our resources and time being spent on responding to the coronavirus pandemic. It seems that they're pursuing an agenda that report after report, independent report after independent report, have said won't make a huge amount of difference and may actually lead to worse development outcomes. And of course, the presentation of this move, I think, has been um, done, you know, at best in a um, in a rather clumsy way, at worst in a in a destructive way, because you know, using phrases like aid can be a giant cash point in the sky helps no one. It helps uh, not the people who work in the sector. It doesn't help even the uh, people, you know, po the co politicians who don't particularly like the development sector because it just feeds into a very tired and, and sometimes racist um, uh, um, portrayal or presentation of what development is about. The, the second reason why this, this worries us um, and many of us in, in civil society in Britain at the moment is, you know, this comes at a, a really important moment in, in British history as Britain navigates Brexit and tries to re-establish its role uh, in a post-Brexit world. And, um, you know, th this country has has, um, has a lot to be proud of in its internationalist um, pursuits. You know, it's no surprise that organisations like Oxfam or the ODI um, were founded in the UK because this has really been a, a, a cluster for development expertise, development thinking, development leadership um, for decades. And, you know, those of us who are internationalists see Britain's continuing role on that uh, platform um, to be really important. But, you know, it, it feels like also an ominous moment because there are these traps that seem to be out there for Britain as it navigates its role in the world. One is a trap of um, almost a sort of retreat internationalism that um, this is a moment, especially with COVID, that Britain is going to retreat into itself. And unfortunately, the presentation of this um, of, of this decision plays into that, that this is about charity beginning at home and this wasted money over there is, 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 not, um, is not good. There's a trap of, of mercantilism that somehow Britain is desperate to strike trade, trade deals from anyone that can, it can reach and it's going to use aid in a very instrumental way to achieve those mercantilist outcomes. Um, and of course, there is this other risk that Britain falls into the trap of sort of neo-imperialism, that somehow there are, you know, maybe even bits of, of the ruling party in the UK who, who wish for empire 2.0 and, and want to see aid or, or wider foreign policy be part of that pursuit. And, uh, you know, those are all, all real dangers. I'm still optimistic. I really do think that um, Britain will come out of this as a much stronger and um, and, and, and will continue its role as a, as a thoughtful and, and influential player on the world stage. Uh, but this decision doesn't augur well. Uh, and Sarah, to your final point around, you know, is this a time to rethink um, what aid is for, what development is for? I think it's always a good time to check ourselves to see is this system, is our sector working as effectively as, as possible? Uh, it's clear we're not. You know, there are some real issues and fundamental transformations that are needed in our sector. I hope at Oxfam we're starting in our own way to to lead by example, I hope, or walk the talk on some of those changes about shifting power, shifting resources in our sector. Um, but it doesn't feel to me like the British government's decision is part of a positive reframing of what development is for in the rest of the 21st century. This isn't about looking again at the greatest way of you know, using aid to pursue sustainable development. It's not part of a positive reframing or rethinking of what aid is for. And in fact, many of us in the, in the UK sector really worry that um, important commitments like the one to spend half of all differed um, money in the most fragile contexts around the world um, are really going to be undermined if the adequate safeguards aren't put in. So, you know, while this isn't necessarily a problem to, to re, you know, reorder um, or rearrange government ministry, the timing, the, uh, the presentation, uh, the wider geopolitical issues at stake, 
and the fact that this isn't really, I don't think, about a positive reframing of development uh, worries many of us in, in the UK development sector. Thanks, Danny. I think um, that really puts uh, the debate pretty much as it should be. The merger in itself is not a problem, it's not an issue. We've heard you know, the positive experience of other countries, you know, priorities with partner countries should you know, dictate um, the objectives of you know, how an integrated um, office can work, but doing it now in the middle of a pandemic with you know, a lot of hurry, also you know, to, to two months time frame, you know, to achieve this this merger and you know the, some of the concerns around the safeguarding and 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 the framing, as you say, of aid is obviously what is um, keeping a lot of us. Um, so to discussing actively, you know, what we need to do to make sure that indeed this can be a more successful and positive transition for the benefit, not just of the UK aid community, but, you know, the development community at large, because as Brigitte said, you know, a lot of us have always been looking at DFID as, you know, sort of this, uh, uh, this beacon of international development that has, you know, led um, on, on policy and thinking for, for a long time. There are a lot of questions from, from the audience in the chat, a lot really curious to hear more of the experience, um, you know, some specific elements, you know, of the mergers in, in Canada and in the Netherlands, and then really trying to, to, to get that experience related to the UK and how, again, we can make sure that indeed we can accompany this transition to be a positive uh, move, you know, to come out with successful outcomes. I'll, I'll, I'll read two or three of the ones there is a ton, so I'll pick some, um, and then, you know, we'll do a, a quick round, you know, to, to address some of them. So there's a question from Andy Frost at uh, NRI, the National Resource Institute, I believe. Um, Particular, I mean, is, is, is I think you, the, the question was posed as you were speaking, Elisa, but I think it was, you know, for also for, for you, Birgitta, uh, to understand how the funding portfolio changed following the mergers, whether there were winners and losers, and if, for instance, you know, the, the merge department spent um, less on, uh, on research. Um, another question around the feedback from the INGOs following the mergers and the ability in their eyes to deliver on the sustainable development goals. Um, um, let me see um, what else. Um, a specific question on gender mainstreaming and how we can ensure that you know this culture um, change that inevitably will accompany the merger of the departments can you know also bring into account you know uh, how to promote gender equality, which is so um, fragile at the moment globally, and how to make sure that it's really fully you know sort of embedded in the integrated world of. Defeat and uh, um, and the Foreign Office. So let, let me start with that, you know, um, very briefly, Elise and and, uh, and Brigitte, and then I'll come to Danny and uh, and Ambassador Isipiso also to offer reflections, and I'll, I'll continue to scan, you know, the questions as they come in. Elisa, I think you're on mute. Sorry, the the bane of our time. Um, so I guess I'd say a couple of things uh, in terms of the resources, just to, to clarify. So we have, uh, there's a couple of things in place and it also speaks to accountability. We have similar um, organizational structures as, as Brigitte did. We have a Minister of Foreign Affairs who oversees all of, uh, and under the Foreign Affairs Act is responsible for Canada's relationships internationally, supported by a Minister of International Development and a Minister of International Trade. Uh, but we, so we have those ministers who are in cabinet and as and act as a team. Um, we do also have uh, annual reporting to Parliament, and that began well before uh, the amalgamation. So in 2008, we had the um, Official Development Assistance Act, and the ODAAA, as we call it, um, it requires any use of official development assistance to do a couple of things. It has to contribute to poverty reduction. It has to take into account the perspectives of the poor. It has to be consistent with international human rights standards uh, and Canadian commitments in that regard. And it requires a consistency with aid effectiveness principles. And so we have to report annually to Parliament uh, against our uh, implementation 
of our ODA against the Official Development Assistance Act. Um, so there's a whole series of accountability measures that are inbuilt in that. There's the DAC uh, peer review process, of course, that we're still accountable for. Uh, and in fact, the most recent uh, DAC peer review looked at how we've come in the last couple of years. Um, and so that was a really interesting exercise. On the money itself, um, our uh, international assistance is governed by DAC principles, um, but we also have something that we created um, a long time ago, uh, which we've been refreshing uh, since about 2008, which is the International Assistance Envelope Framework. Uh, and that International Assistance Envelope Framework uh, is the guide that helps to ensure how resources are allocated towards development, humanitarian assistance, international financial institutions, and peace and security. And so we, we have those guardrails, and that establishes the relationship by which resources are allocated um, how, dis, how if we're seeking additional resources, uh, for instance, in response to catastrophic events to make sure that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. And we've built guardrails over time to be able to address that. We created a crisis pool so that we weren't pooling money from uh, long term sustainable development to be able to allocate it towards rapid onset emergencies. Um, more recently in the 2018 budget, uh, a new special purpose fund was created again to address more political events that might occur, a G7, a G20, so that that pot of resources exists there that was additional monies from the fiscal framework to respond to those kinds of initiatives. So again, you're not drawing resources away from our longer term sustainable development objectives and the partnerships uh, and agreements that we've arranged with our partner countries, which I think is really the essential point that the High Commissioner made, uh, is that our efforts are driven by this collaboration with partner countries uh, and how are we seeking to achieve their objectives. So. I don't think from our perspective there were any winners or losers. Um, if anything, what it has tried to enable us to do is to use those um, pockets of money more effectively um, and to try to make sure that the resources towards peace and conflict and stabilization are complementing what we're doing on the development humanitarian side, that the, the triple nexus, uh, that's one that we continue to, to struggle with. but. Um, now, because we're in the same ministry, actually, we're making a concerted effort now to follow up on, okay, how do we build mechanisms now in place to be able to enhance that approach to the triple nexus? So I think that's what I would say with respect to funding portfolios. Um, feedback from INGOs, I, I, I suspect that you'll reach out and engage them. Um, it, it was the decision to... Um, Pull the departments together was controversial uh, within the CSO community, but that was also uh, at a moment in time where the relationships were also um, tender anyway um, within the, the CSO community. But I would say that over time, um, they have come to see that, in fact, uh, it has enabled sustainable development principles um, to infuse the ministry in a way that um, wasn't fully the case before. Um, so I think it has been to a net advantage. Um, I think most of our CSO partners would say that. Um, and we still have dedicated collaborations within the ministry that focus on that development relationship um, with CSOs. So we still have a partnerships uh, branch, uh, for instance, which I used to head, um, which enables that direct uh, and, and consistent engagement. So I, I don't think that the CSO community would say that we've moved away from achieving the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let me, let me actually bring in Ambassador AC pieces on this because I'd be interested to hear if you uh, if you've heard any reaction, you know, within Kenya from you know Kenyan NGOs, what their reaction to an announcement of the merger of DFID has been, um, and wh or, or whether you know again your reflection both at the government level and with civil society is that perhaps on the ground not much will change, or whether there is concern, you know, as much as there is in the UK in within the NGO community. Now I'll come to you, Brigitte, to carry on the conversation um, on, on the questions from the audience. Back home, I haven't had uh, much concern yet from the uh, CSO sector. I think we, we, we have heard uh, from people and organizations who want to know a little more about what's gonna happen. 
I think they are watching keenly to hear uh, where the, 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 the UK places its priorities, but they understand that we have been engaged with the UK uh, over a long period of time and that uh, uh, new areas of priority are likely to be agreed uh, in this uh, in discussions that that we were involved in so there aren't concerns about how things will move abruptly they are just normal concerns that go with there is going to be change how is that change going to affect us are we being consulted in how we move forward and and th these these appear to be fairly clear clear issues for us Thank you. And that is consistent with comments we're getting from the audience. You know, we have a comment from Ethiopia stating how you know they are concerned, you know, potentially about the impact that this will have on you know the engagement with civil society um, in their country. Um, but Brigitte, back to you on the questions about thanks, Ambassador Cities, um, on the question about you know winners and losers on the funding. But I also would like to add another question that's come from the audience about you know you spoke about the challenges of retaining and grow you know, development expertise. And, and one of the questions we've received from Archana Patkar from UNAIDS is actually how can you retain and grow this expertise, particularly when morale is so low? Um, and that is definitely the situation in BIFID today. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Well, first, winners and losers, we, we, we were never separate, so we never had this winning or losing uh, uh, game. Um, um, but but uh, I think what Elisa mentioned is also uh, relevant, what we have, the way we have um, uh, uh, organized it, is that we also have a few funds, um, some are entirely non-ODA, but others are combined ODA and non-ODA. For example, on human rights and promoting human rights, there is ODA and non-ODA money into that fund. And the same applies to a so-called stability fund, where we also have put ODA money, not much, really very little compared to the total amount. But with that particular fund, you can actually do the more political integrated type of activities and thereby also fence off the bulk of the money, which goes to poverty alleviation. Um, less money on research, and no, I mean, there's no more or less because we were never separate, but I don't, I don't think there's a change there. Uh, delivery on SDGs, I think it is, um, it is easier to deliver on SDGs from a position from within a, a ministry, especially if you have a separate Minister for Development, Cooperation and Trade, in, which is the case in our case. Because Minister Kaag, she has really, because she's this, she has these two hats, she has really good uh, relationships with the employers, um, employees, I should say, uh, or, um, no, sorry, employers, uh, organizations. Uh, organization and also with the other ministries and she's therefore able to mainstream the whole SDG agenda in into other ministries and also ensure that companies uh, put more effort into uh, for example making the whole value chain more sustainable and, and durable and and, and, and and more fair so there's there are there are more opportunities to achieve the SDGs as opposed to being in your own, well, if I can call it silo, dealing with development cooperation. Uh, on gender mainstreaming, this was another point that you mentioned, Sarah. I think we're here, we, we have our own task group and normally a task group or task force stays only for a limited time. I, m I must say this one has been here with us for a very long time and not long ago I actually asked the question for how much longer should we go on with this task force and I got very angry looks because people said there's no way we can should get rid of it there's still a lot of work to do so the task force is remaining um, and how to retain the morale um, um, when the morale is low well I mean I, I always believe that there is intrinsic motivation um, uh, with people to contribute to a better world and uh, what is important is that your ministry and that the personnel department uh, ensures that you find these people and also make it clear to them that uh, these are the people that we need in our ministry in order to, to work on development cooperation. So this is, I think, what I would have to say. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. no, that's a very mm -hmm. good point. Um, Danny, there is a question on the, you know, the scrutiny and the accountability, what we think is going to happen to ICAI or some of the scrutiny mechanisms. It would be useful to, to hear what you think, but also what we should, in a way, as a civil society think and community, really 
a push for in terms of the accountability mechanisms that we think should be retained? So I think there are lots of uh, things we hope. Um, I mean, if this decision is, is set in stone and going to go ahead, I, I really do think there are some clear reassurances that government needs to give and can give. And uh, we've been working with other, other colleagues in, in Bond, the UK development organisation platform, to come up with a few asks, whether it's about an independent parliamentary oversight, the retention of ICAI, um, a separate minister at cabinet level to protect the interests of, 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 of development in, and, and sustainable development, and argue the aspirational case for sustainable development at cabinet level. So I think the, the asks are, are fairly clear. And I think that, you know, over the next few months, that will be really important for us to watch and hold government to account. And, you know, again, as a consumer of, 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 of aid over the last few years and, and having received um, grants from both the U, uh, Canadian and um, Dutch ministries, it was always clear. I mean, I remember having conversations with Dutch officials about how much parliamentary scrutiny there is about Dutch development spending. And we were told in, you know, in very clear terms about the, um, you know, what, what this partnership would involve and what the sort of key criteria were. Um, and so I think there are effective ways of ensuring that accountability, which also has positive feedback loops, because if this is about reassuring the British public that our taxpayer money is being spent as effectively as it could be, then these assurances will help not just reassure people like us to make sure there's a sort of high quality impact, but also uh, taxpayers and other stakeholders. Um, but it's also important to note that this isn't just about money. And I think uh, Nardos from Ethiopia and Achana from UNAIDS have both made points about the expertise that's um, potentially at stake here, the, the morale of people inside DFID and other, other, you know, the wider development sector. You know, we, we talk about billions, you know, a few $150 billion worth of, of, of aid money spent. And DFID is, yes, a really important uh, part of those financial flows or those investments. But really, when aid is at its best, when you know institutions like DFID are at their best, they're not just talking about investments, they're talking about innovation, they're talking about influencing, leveraging the impact of that aid money. And that's another concern here because, you know, it, it, again, DFID at its best has been when it's been innovating on mainstreaming gender or pioneering new forms of humanitarian assistance, or countless other examples. Um, or similarly, you know, different officials or other UK uh, government officials using their position to influence others on, on wider progressive uh, agendas. And my worry is that, you know, this isn't just about money and making sure that money is being invested uh, wisely and accountably. It's about that morale, that spirit, that confidence that you want uh, in this system. And I really fear, and it's, you know, it comes ironically at a time when uh, Michael Gove, who uh, you know, for foreign um, business, is the, is the cabinet office minister, very senior advisor to the UK prime minister, made a very important speech just a couple of weeks ago, talking about how important it is for senior government officials to have deep expertise, deep knowledge of the issues they work on, so that they can make effective contribution to towards progress on that issue. And it seems really sort of bitterly ironic um, that just as he's standing on a public platform making that very powerful case, the sort of expertise, the really important sort of social capital, the soft skills that have been built up over the last 20 years uh, inside so that they can play a rightful role in, in doing development well is being dismantled. And so, yes, it's about the money, but it's also about those other things that DFID can contribute in the world and the UK can contribute in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. But we've heard, obviously, both from Elisa and Brigitte, that there is a way to retain that development expertise. And again, it's how we also advocate for, you know, how the merger is executed, not necessarily um, seeing that, you know, we, uh, yeah, there, there is a lot of important expertise in the Foreign Office, but how we make sure that the specific development expertise that DFID brings is preserved, maintained, safeguarded, including long term, because Brigitte, you clearly pointed out to the fact that long term, you know, when you start looking at perhaps reduction in funding or, you know, making changes to staffing, that's where the risk becomes greater. And perhaps, perhaps the thing for us in the UK as a wider community is reflecting on the, the exact asks that we need to articulate um, to make sure that you know the transition learns you know these lessons. I mean, yesterday the Secretary of State was talking a lot about learning 
from the experience of others, you know, when asked in Parliament by um, the IDC about the merger. So we need to make sure that, you know, the lessons that we're hearing about are really, you know, brought to bear in the transition. Um, we started to get to time, but we got, you know, more questions. And there is one in particular um, from Kenya. So I'll come um, to you, Ambassador, um, that says that Kenyan NGOs are actually concerned about the implications of the merger um, and asks whether the panel has a view on whether, you know, development contracts that are ongoing will be honoured and how the UK government should communicate to reassure its partners. And then another question, you know, perhaps for the whole panel to reflect on before we come to the conclusion, um, both in, in global affairs in Canada and in both in the Netherlands, uh, the, the, the merge, the integrated um, offices include trade. And that's a matter that this is missing from the FCDO. Should trade be included to make a more effective new department? An interesting um, question. So Ambassador ACP is on the specific concerns of the Kenyan NGO community um, on, and how, how the UK should communicate its change, it discuss, you know, its, its plans. You, know, you already touched on that um, before. Yeah, thank you. I, I think there's, there's two things. One is that the NGOs must continue to engage with whoever their interlocutors are so that their, their position is, is clear. Uh, what's the plan, their planning cycle, for instance? What are they committed to? And are those commitments uh, embedded in a signature? If there are signatures existing, I expect that the UK government uh, will meet its obligations. Uh, but going forward, there has to be a discussion about what are the priorities that they stand for and what are the new priorities that may be espoused by the UK government. Those priorities, as I said, need to be discussed. And then that will determine uh, how, how you move forward with programs. But there should be, uh, uh, at some point, uh, direct communication from the agencies responsible uh, on the UK side to say, this is the, this is the path we are trading. These are the obligations we, we, we are going to meet. Uh, if there are areas that need to be adjusted, there has to be a proper discussion around it uh, so that uh, decisions taken are taken amicably with all stakeholders having been consulted. And on the question of trade, should trade be also, um, you think, brought into this integrated department? I, I think we continue to engage fairly robustly uh, on trade uh, outside of, of DFID and outside of FCO. Um, I think it's really what you focus on trying to attain that, that matters, uh, not whether the, the, the department lies within, uh, within FCO or not. Great, thanks. Um, Brigitte, your views on, uh, particularly on the trade question. It's, it's not an easy, an easy question because we have had this combination now for, I think, six years. Um, and I cannot say that the ministry or uh, that the minister, previous ministers did not function or functioned worse because they didn't combine the two hats. But I, I do see advantages when it comes to the SDG agenda, that this, this Minister for Development Corporation is also the Minister for Foreign Trade, uh, especially because companies, they... Uh, and the globalization agenda, they, 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 there's so much more uh, investment and also uh, um, uh, a high level of consciousness with companies to do things in a different way. So the, the, I think the, 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 the two, development corporation branch and the, and, the, and, the, and the trade branch, the companies branch, they have, they have grown closer together. So there, there, is, there is really uh, an added, uh, added value of combining those two. But, it's not to say that if you don't, then the whole project will not succeed. I don't believe that, no. Thanks. Um, Elisa, your thoughts on this, but also a question has just come in from Matt UK that talks about uh, an article in DevEx that indicates today that the FCDO will be an integrated department and will not have an ODA department inside it. And I think that was what the Secretary of State was indicating yesterday. Um, and whether you, you, know, you feel that this could in, in a way, impinge on um, the, the the same sort of successful outcomes that you read in Canada. Sorry, I don't totally understand the question. 
So in, the idea is that there's not going to be, you know, a separate um, function within the integrated department that, you know, that it's going to be just one. No, it's not going to be an ODA, you know, sort of separate development cooperation um, sort of function within the integrated department. It's going to be integrated at all levels. Well, that that's very much the model that we have, uh, which is that um, we have everything integrated down. Uh, it took us a couple of years to get there. It was sequenced, um, but that, that is ultimately the, the model that we have. But again, we have a Minister of International Development uh, who still retains uh, a distinctive responsibility and authority and works in collaboration with the Minister of International Trade and the Minister of Foreign Affairs to advance the agenda as a team. Um, so I think that might be one of the distinctions between the the two approaches and and so our model is more similar to the dutch in that respect um before i touch on the trade issue i did want to come back to the gender equality issue because um i would say that uh it of course our evolution has been one where we've always been a strong advocate for gender equality. The former Canadian International Development Agency was a early proponent within the development community. It was one of the first international development agencies to really advocate for gender equality and development cooperation. Um, at, but also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was a strong advocate on international human rights and gender equality. And so the bringing together of the two, um, I think, has uh, made that stronger. And then, of course, under the current government, we have the overarching feminist feminist foreign policy um, and the feminist foreign policy is drive drives a perspective of equality and inclusion and diversity as the overarching objective of foreign policy uh, and of addressing structural inequalities and so um, the expectation is that uh, we we do and we will continue to drive those issues going forward trade as Brigitte says is um, I think it's more in the opportunities that it presents. Uh, and this is the one I would say of the issues um, that maybe we haven't fully realized um, the potential. That's the area where I think we're still realizing the potential of those two entities being physically with one another. But there are opportunities and I agree it's with the sustainable development goals where we really see how those two things are uh, coming together. Uh, we've seen it most recently in the context of the pandemic when we've been looking at global supply chains and collaborations um, so that our the development team has been able to work with our trade commissioner service, for instance, to support the African Union uh, and colleagues in the Caribbean to be able to access supply chains that if, the, if it had just been the development colleagues on their own before, they wouldn't have had the, net, the experts, the connections in different countries to be able to provide that kind of expertise. Similarly, if I look at um, the collaborations that exist around clean technology, um, and advancing climate finance and delivering on the Paris Agreement, the fact that we've got the trade and the development colleagues together, there are these synergies um, that we've started to build on, but I think that's really where the potential lies um, to, to move further. ESG, uh, and again, the collaboration between the Trade Commissioner Service, the trade policy, um, and the development colleagues, I think that's really where we're starting to see benefits. We've got a solid foundation on things like trade facilitation for developing countries and things that we've done with Trademark East Africa, uh, the Trade Facilitation Office. Um, when we negotiate new trade agreements, for instance, with um, developing country counterparts, we have a mechanism that we've created uh, internally. It's an international trade facilitation mechanism where su expert support is provided to developing country counterparts so that they can negotiate on an even playing field. So these are all things that we've been realizing as a result of the coming together of the two entities, but I think it's still some unrealized potential um, for us going forward. Great, thanks. Um, Dania, I just have one uh, final question for you and then we're gonna do a really quick wrap up round um, in the last five minutes. What would reassure you that the UK is taking the right steps towards you know, a, a merger that really takes full account of the lessons we've heard today um, and is starting to, you know, kind of move in a, in a direction where we can continue to retain, you know, the best that, you know, DFID has had to offer over the past 20 years. 
I think in the short term, all of those things we've, we've been mentioning, you know, independent oversight, the retention of some of that accountability infrastructure, uh, uh, sticking to the letter and the spirit of DAC rules when it comes to ODA, all of those things I think in the short term would be reassuring. In the long term, and I see a question there about, you know, UK government's pursuit of human rights. I think in the long term, what would be ultimately reassuring is that Britain defines what its values are when it comes to its role in the world and this you know it becomes less about the mechanics of government or indeed less about whether there's an integrated trade and development ministry it's much more about what in a post-brexit world does britain stand for and what is there what is the sort of values base on which it's going to pursue all different aspects of its of its foreign policy and there is a huge opportunity to do that because there is an integrated review that was due to take place has now been delayed. But I think this is the moment, you know, if Brexit, Brexit is a reality, Britain has to come to terms with its new role in the world. Um, and, you know, I think what we, re you know, really, re not just reassuring, but inspiring is to come up with a progressive values-based internationalism of which international development is an important part, but not the only part. That would be ultimately reassuring. Great. Uh, we've got exactly five minutes, so I'll come to each of you for a one minute final reflection. We've heard a lot of good pointers about, you know, how this merger can really um, sort of, yeah, proceed and, and, and um, be successful. But your top tip in one minute to really make the merger a success. So, Brigitte, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always have to. You have to be careful in 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 the diplomatic arena whether I'm not uh, trespassing um, uh, what I what I should or should not say. But I, I would say a lobby for a cabinet minister. I don't know if that's still an option or not. Um, but that the person who deals with ODA sits uh, at, the, at the cabinet. Um, uh, see it as an opportunity um, to th this merger because there are really a lot of uh, of, of potential benefits. Uh, build a culture of a one-team approach. Uh, we all know the saying, culture eats structure for breakfast, and I think it applies here as well. Um, and, and don't forget to uh, invest in, um, in, 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 in recruiting and retaining uh, your expertise. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Danny. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, if there's an official listening and you're shaping sort of foreign policy or, you know, FCDO policy, um, I think my challenge to you is, you know, prove us wrong. Come back in the next few weeks um, with some measures that would really um, reassure us. You know, we are about, you know, in the midst of the great reversal on development outcomes, decades of progress are being undone by the impact of COVID, of the COVID pandemic. When the FCDO does launch properly, I would love to see something that really puts the commitment to to reducing poverty at the heart of that you know show off in a way this you know it's a sort of the best way to reacting to criticism it's with some positive leadership and i hope that's what we we'll get to see in the next few weeks very good elisa it's hard to boil it down uh, i agree with everything that brigida said um a hundred percent uh i think it's the one team um, you've got, and you've got to just be ruthless in reinforcing and incentivizing and encouraging, um, build up the expertise, respect individual expertise, but it has to be more than the sum of its parts. Um, and that's the advantage of doing this ultimately. But if you don't do that, uh, then you won't realize the full potential of it. Um, I also agree with Danny in terms of an overarching policy statement can um, certainly enable uh, that because you see where the synergies lie, right? So the, the overarching, on, in our case, the feminist foreign policy, but then the sectoral policies that talk to each other. So the feminist international assistance policy alongside an inclusive trade agenda comes together in growth that works for everyone. Um, so there, there are these opportunities if you've got clarity of purpose, um, but you also will have to understand that it takes several years um, for this to realize its full potential. And so there'll have to be patience, iteration, um, but a commitment um, to being able to del deliver ultimately um, the best of UK international expertise in one house. And you can do that, uh, but you've got to be focused and deliberate about it. Excellent. And last but not least, Ambassador ACP, so actually the, the lead um, the leader of the transition team is your, you know, direct former counterpart, the former High Commissioner to Kenya, Nick Haley. So if you had to talk to Nick, what would be your top tip to make the merger a success? 
Well, uh, thanks, Sarah, again. I think for from my point of view, we, we, we see this as an opportunity. There is always an opportunity uh, in these changes. And it's an opportunity for, for refocusing on what the core values are and what the real, the, the real performance areas are or should be. And I think uh, from, from uh, the Kenyan perspective, and I think our NGOs will, uh, will, will agree, if, if this focus remains in the areas that we, we continue to engage on, in education, in health, in poverty reduction, in social protection, in climate change, governance issues, trade, uh, gender equality, uh, these are things that we think are shared uh, shared values. Uh, there are shared opportunities there. We have an opportunity to to continue to make a difference uh, in the lives of our people. But stakeholder engagement and collaboration has to be the anchor point. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been an incredibly rich discussion, and I think it's offered a lot of very useful pointers for the Foreign Office DFA transition team um, as a start, you know, working for the merger, you know, in September. I hope they were listening. If not, they can watch online afterwards. Uh, but there is, you know, a lot um, to reflect on. And thank you to uh, all of you for joining today. I really encourage you to uh, to share today's reflections, to the, you know, the lessons we have heard, you know, the useful pointers that these discussions has offered um, in our ongoing, you know, debates, analysis, discussions that we can share as the work, you know, the transition work starts um, and, and the move towards the merger, the merger um, gather space. Um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to accompany, you know, the transition to, to help shape it in a way that it is successful and that the F FCDO emerges a stronger um, department. Um, but we're also marking the 60th anniversary of ODI, so I just want to flag that while I have you. We're hosting a series of events um, throughout this year in early um, 20, 2021. Yesterday, we released um, the first um, iteration of our Global Reset Dialogue. Um, we have you know, an, a, a fantastic array of world leaders that are offering the online reflections on how we can together you know, address you know, global challenges um, beyond coronavirus. So if you log on to odi.org forward slash 60, you'll hear from Nobel laureates, current and former heads of state, academics, and business and civil society leaders. Um, but thank you so much again to such a fantastic panel um, and to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again um at ODI event soon.